Okay, hello everyone. Good afternoon to today's session on optimizing cost and performance in Amazon S3. So the goal for today is to provide you immediate steps you can take to optimize your cost and performance right now in Amazon S3. My name is Christoph Bartenstein. I'm the director of Amazon S3 Intelligent Storage, a new storage class we launched a few years ago, which automatically optimizes cost uh, for our customers. Today with me, I have Andrew Kutzi, who is a product manager in Cambridge, UK, as well as I'm excited to have Zane Reynolds here today from Torque Robotics. And he will talk about how Torque Robotics is optimizing cost at petabyte scale. Now, with that said, let's get started. So, we'll talk today a little bit about different storage classes. What storage classes to use for what access patterns. We'll talk about different features you have in S3 to develop insights, like storage lens, to move data from one storage class to another storage class, like lifecycle policies. And then we'll talk about how customers are optimizing storage cost and performance at petabyte scale and what tools you can have to do that. Now, the really important takeaway for today is really the steps you take right now, and we'll tell you about this a little bit more. Now, before I get started, let me say thank you. Thank you to all of you in the room, but also thank you to the millions of customers who use Amazon S3 today. It's always exciting to see what they're doing on S3. As many of you know, Amazon S3 started 16 years ago. And as many of you remember, the typical use cases back then were backup and um, sometimes disaster recovery, oftentimes storage for the internet. Now, when you think about the use cases today, they really range from data lakes to log files to video recordings to media archives, to mobile sync and storage. And so there's virtually customers with all sizes on Amazon S3, from small customers to large customers, and across different industries and geographies. And it's very exciting to see what they're doing on top of S3. Now, you might wonder, why is there a picture of a robot on Mars? Well, that's one of the use cases I want to talk about. So in that use case, there's a robot on Mars which makes pictures. They send the picture to a satellite. That sends the picture down to an S3 bucket, the global endpoint. And then that picture is analyzed from different users. And that picture is then shared across thousands of end customers across the world. And you can imagine, in a use case like that, you want to have optimized cost. You want to have optimized performance. You want to have optimized cost because you store a lot of data. But you also want to have optimized performance because you want to analyze your data. And you want to share it across different endpoints. Now, that customer benefit from the scale of S3. When you step back for a moment, S3 started 16 years ago, and you have exabytes of data spanning trillions of objects. Now, Amazon S3 is also a very large distributed system, which means it can scale to millions of requests per second. And at peak, we're seeing that. And so as customers, you're getting this industry-leading availability, scalability, and performance for the different use cases you have. And today, I want to talk about how you can use that in a perfect way. Now, why is all that important? Well, it's important because data is growing faster than ever. In fact, IDC creates this year, there are more than 100 zettabytes created or replicated just in this year alone. Now, 100 zettabytes is a lot of data. Um, to break that down, let's imagine a 10 terabyte hard disk. I know 10 terabytes, that's not the newest hard disk you can get, but the math is much simpler, so stay with me. One hand zettabytes over the 10 terabyte hard disks, you can stack them from the Earth to the Moon, back to the Earth, and one time back to the Moon. So you talk about a lot of data. And customers tell us constantly when we talk with them about, they want to store the data because it creates a lot of value, but they don't want to do that in a cost-optimized way, in a performance-optimized way. So let's talk about the steps you want to take to optimize the cost. When customers optimize cost, there are typical ways how they can do that. We call them pillars of cost optimization. And those are really typical ways we see customers very successfully optimize cost. The first one is really about use case requirements. So we talk here about what use case requirements do you have for your use case? What availability do you need? What performance do you need? What's the durability you want to have? Once you have figured that out, you want to develop insights into your storage. Now, insights into your storage is important because once you know what's going on, you can optimize it. 
And the last step is really optimizing and measure those actions. Now, let me ask you this question. Why is it so important to develop insights into your storage? Well, Andrew will talk a little bit about that. <laughs> well, it's important because if you can't see how your storage is used, you can't really take action. Now, when many customers just get started in AWS, their storage requirements might consist of a few S3 buckets. But as they grow from millions to billions of objects, things become a little bit more complicated. A customer may suddenly have tens or even hundreds of accounts and thousands of S3 buckets that span across numerous AWS regions. Customers that are managing these sorts of environments want to be able to understand how storage is used across the entirety of the organization, to be able to see point-in-time metrics, and to be able to analyze trend lines. Now, over the last several years, data lakes have grown from petabyte to even exabyte scale. And these data lakes often span across hundreds of uh, buckets and thousands of prefixes. Managing, optimizing, and reporting for these data lakes can be challenging. And we talked to customers across a really wide range of industries who were telling us that they wanted visibility into their storage to avoid having to go bucket by bucket or account by account to gather the details that they needed. They wanted the ability to analyze data at the granularity that was required for their root cause analysis. And they wanted the ability to take those insights into something that was actionable. And so that's why we launched S3 Storage Lens. S3 Storage Lens provides organization-wide visibility into your storage usage to improve cost efficiency and data protection. It provides a single view into your storage usage across hundreds of accounts in your organization with drill downs all the way down to the prefix level. It's a visual and a highly interactive dashboard that's built right into the S3 console, and perhaps most importantly and best of all, is automatically configured for all customers for free. And just last week, we added 34 new metrics to S3 Storage Lens. This brings the total metric count to more than 60. And with these new metrics, you get deeper visibility into your storage usage to improve how you optimize your cost. Have you ever wondered the question, how much has your storage increased over the last 90 days across the entirety of your organization? Now, that is a question that you can answer with S3 Storage Lens. Now, S3 Storage Lens is also going to help uh, give you new insights into how you optimize cost. For example, you can use it to identify infrequently accessed buckets. It's also going to help you with your data protection use cases, where you can use metrics to improve your data protection policies, like replication, object lock, and encryption. Now, one of the really awesome things that you can do with S3 Storage Lens in terms of optimizing your cost today is identifying incomplete multi-part uploads. And just for a little bit of context, Multi-part uploads accelerate the uploading of objects by splitting your objects into logical parts that can be uploaded in parallel. Now, there's a really awesome performance benefit when you use multi-part uploads, and later in today's performance section of the presentation, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So when you use multi-part uploads, those parts are stored in S3 until the upload is complete or is stopped. And so what that means for you is that you end up paying for the parts. Now here, the red line shows the object count, and the blue line shows the number of incomplete multi-part uploads that are older than seven days. As a best practice, you should set a lifecycle policy to stop multi-part uploads that don't complete within a specified number of days, so let's say seven days. And so with this lifecycle policy, S3 uh, will stop the multi-part upload, and it'll delete the parts that are associated with it. Now, there are many customers who are using S3 Storage Lens today. And it's always really, really exciting to talk to these customers about how they use S3 Storage Lens and how they use the metrics and the insights to improve and optimize their cost. Now, one customer that we've talked to is Capital One. Being in a highly regulated industry, Capital One uses S3 versioning, which provides them with extra production in the event of an accidental delete or an overwrite. They wanted to implement versioning in a way that was cost effective and to ensure that they were not unnecessarily storing copies of data. One metric that was particularly useful for Capital One was the size and the number of versions that were current versus not. So using S3 Storage Lens, Capital One was able to identify a subset of old version data and optimize the storage of this data by moving that data down to S3 Glacier Deep Archive. 
Another metric that was really useful for Capital One was the average size of these versions, because they use lifecycle, lifecycle charges per object, and they wanted to avoid having to transition millions of small, old versioned objects. So in addition to using S3 storage lens right in the S3 console, you can publish your storage lens metrics directly to Amazon CloudWatch. Now this route is particularly helpful if you already use CloudWatch today and you want to create a unified view to look at your storage lens metrics alongside other application metrics using CloudWatch dashboards. Now another really awesome thing that you can do here is you can set up notifications using CloudWatch alarms. So let's take, for, let's take an example here. You can set up an alarm and be notified if there's an increase in the number of incomplete multi-part uploads in a given account. In addition, you can use the CloudWatch APIs to develop applications that access these storage lens metrics, or you can also give access to integrated AWS partners. Now, S3 storage lens is really great for insights down to the prefix level. What, do we, what if you want to go to the object level? Well, if you want to go to the object level, you should consider using S3 inventory which lets you report on your storage and list all of the objects that you have for a given prefix or a bucket. S3 Inventory provides a list of your objects and the associated metadata of those objects, including object name, object size, encryption status, replication status, whether an object is current or not, and much, much more. Now, one thing that many of our customers are doing is using S3 Inventory with Amazon Athena to derive actionable insights. Now, Athena uses SQL expressions to analyze your data is very commonly used for ad hoc data discovery. For example, a customer can use Athena to further filter the inventory report and get a list of objects that are non-current versions and greater than a specified size. So now that we've talked about some of the tools that you can use to identify trends, let's talk about storage classes. Storage classes are how you store your data in S3 and are optimized for specific access patterns. Now, before you choose a storage class, it's really important to identify whether you have data with known or predictable access patterns or data with unknown, changing, or unpredictable access patterns. Let's talk a little bit about data that has known or predictable access patterns, such as data that becomes infrequently accessed after a definitive period of time. Let's take, for example, user-generated content, like photos and videos that we share with our friends and family. Now, that content is going to be frequently accessed right after we upload it, but becomes infrequently accessed after a few weeks, or perhaps even after a few days. For use cases like these, customers know when data becomes infrequently accessed and can pinpoint the right time to move their data to a storage class that's really cost-optimized for that access pattern. So as you can see here, the retrieval rate for a particular data set starts with a moderately high retrieval, but then it drastically cools off. And this is actually a very real use case. We're looking at an online content sharing application that stores videos and photos. And this is a screenshot from S3 Storage Lens. The blue line shows the total volume of data stored, and the red line shows the retrieval rate. This is defined as the number of gigabytes retrieved over the number of gigabytes stored. Often, customers with predictable access patterns observe that the percentage of data accessed every month, which we refer to as a retrieval rate, is consistently low after data becomes rarely accessed. And once you make this observation, once you identify this trend, you can configure an S3 lifecycle policy to move your data to a storage class that's really cost-optimized for that specific access pattern. So one really common use case where data has known or predictable access patterns is medical imaging, where you have hospitals and imaging centers that retain petabytes of data for decades to meet regulatory requirements. Typically, healthcare providers expect that when an X-ray or a CT study is generated, it's typically frequently accessed by various individuals. You have the practicing physician, the technicians, the radiologist, so on and so forth. After a month or two, that X-ray or that CT study is rarely ever accessed again, perhaps for a patient visit or in the event that a radiologist needs to review a patient's prior history. Let's take a look at another example where news organizations store content, such as footage from past sporting events and every clip given by government officials. 
Now this content is gonna be rarely accessed for very long periods of time, and is really only accessed when there's a breaking news event. When this happens, media organizations require that data be immediately accessible so that newsrooms and editors can act quickly. And lastly, and perhaps the most relatable example, user-generated content. I'm sure many of us in this room use some form of, of a photo-sharing website to store photographs and videos that we expect to treasure forever. Once we upload a photo, we may share it, it would then get downloaded a few times, but after a period of time, those images likely see a major decline in access frequency. So now that we've talked about a few of the common use cases where data has known or predictable access patterns, as a next step, you wanna choose a storage class that best matches your requirements and really how you wanna use your data. To support these use cases that we just discussed, we have a number of storage classes to choose from and really for every imaginable use case. In the following slides, we're gonna talk about how you can match your access pattern to the right S3 storage class. Let's say you're streaming content and you wanna use S3 as the origin. That content is gonna be frequently accessed by users all around the globe. In this case, you should use S3 standard, which is really the cost optimized and the ideal storage class for data that is frequently accessed. And this is the best choice if you access your data more than once a month. Now let's say you have a photo sharing application where end users can upload photos and videos. Those images, those videos, are gonna become infrequently accessed. In this case, you should consider using S3 standard infrequent access to save on storage costs compared to S3 standard. Now S3 standard infrequent access and the storage classes to follow, so really everything to the right here, are really designed for less frequently accessed data, where your cost to store data decreases, but the cost to access that data moderately increases. Now specifically, S3 standard infrequent access is really cost optimized and really the ideal storage class for data that is accessed once every month or two. Now let's say you have medical records or news broadcasting content, where that data must be immediately accessible, but is really only accessed a few times a year. In this case, you should consider S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval. S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval is the ideal storage class for data that is accessed once per quarter. But what if you have archived data that does not require that data be immediately accessible, but is stored for very long periods of time, such as logs or compliance data? In this case, you should consider S3 Glacier Flexible Retrieval. Now, S3 Glacier Flexible Retrieval delivers additional cost savings over S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval with expedited retrievals in minutes and free bulk retrievals in five to 12 hours. This makes it really the ideal storage class for backup and disaster recovery use cases. Now, for long-term archives, you should consider S3 Glacier Deep Archive. S3 Glacier Deep Archive delivers the lowest cost storage in the cloud, about a dollar per terabyte, and retrieval times of 12 to 48 hours. Now, I wanna highlight here that every industry has an archiving use case, from storing sports highlights or other news broadcasting content, medical records and genomic sequence data. If you take a step back and you think about your business, it'd really be no surprise that you, that you too have an archival use case. Whether it's to meet compliance requirements, to retain historical data for future analyses, or to create a secondary copy for, uh, as part of your data protection strategy. I wanna talk about one customer in particular. Now, when we launched S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval last year, we began to work really closely with Snap to help them optimize their cost while allowing them to focus on innovation. And this was really important after Snap launched Memories in 2016. Just for a little bit of context, Memories is a feature that automatically archives media content and resurfaces it to their end users over time. So what this means for Snap is that their users may not view this content for potentially years at a time. Now this is an important consideration, knowing that Snap stores over two exabytes of data and roughly 1.5 trillion media files. So as Snap's storage needs increased, they wanted to optimize their storage without affecting performance and without affecting the customer experience. 
Snap used S3 storage lens to get better insight into what they were storing and to make informed decisions that allow them to better optimize costs and move data to S3 Glacier and some retrieval, which allowed them to save millions of dollars. To recap, in deciding and determining when to use which S3 storage class, there's really three factors that you want to consider. The first is the frequency of access. The second is the duration of storage. The third are your retrieval requirements. For example, S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval is really cost optimized and is the ideal storage class for data that is accessed once per quarter. And this is because although the storage price is lower than S3 standard infrequent access, the cost to access that data is slightly higher, which means that there's a break even point where if you're storing data that's accessed too frequently, it would make sense to keep that potentially in S3 standard infrequent access or even in S3 standard. Additionally, S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval has a minimum storage duration of 90 days. So let's say you upload a file and you expect to delete that file within 90 days. We'd say that you should consider S3 standard or S3 standard infrequent access, just keeping in mind here that S3 standard infrequent access also has a minimum storage duration of 30 days. Okay, so let's say that you identify that you have known access patterns and you go down this route of optimizing the lifecycle of your data. To do this, you would use S3 lifecycle policies, which are rules that you can set up to move objects to another storage class after a given number of days. Lifecycle policies are based on the creation date of the object and can be filtered to apply to the bucket, the prefix, or set of tagged objects. Now I wanna go back to that example I was talking about earlier, medical imaging. When an image is generated, it's frequently accessed for a short period of time by various individuals. But after a period of time, it's rarely ever accessed again. In this particular scenario, you can use Lifecycle to move your data from S3 standard, a storage class, again, that's designed for frequent access to storage, to S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval after 90 days. And then after an additional period of time, further optimize that storage by moving that data to S3 Glacier Deep Archive. Now we've talked a bit about which storage class to use when you have known access patterns. But what if your data has unknown or unpredictable access patterns? Access patterns. In fact, the majority of data has unknown access patterns. So let me ask you this. Um, let's raise hands. Who in the room has a use case where we don't really know what the access patterns are or access patterns change over time? It's a lot of people. So what we see when we talk with customers that for certain use cases, we know exactly what's happening with data. It's frequently accessed at the beginning, but then over time, it cools off. However, there are a lot of use cases out there where access patterns are really unpredictable. It's very hard to figure out what's going on. Let me give you some examples. Think about a data lake. When you have a data lake, when it's a shared data set, and you have multiple clients accessing that data. Well, over time, that access might change. Imagine a scenario where a healthcare company, different scientists working on one data set, they analyze the data, they produce results, and then they store data. For several months, maybe, that data is not accessed. But then maybe after half a year, after some results get back, maybe there's a new study coming out, and that data all in a sudden becomes accessed again. So that happens. And so you have a lot of use cases where data has unknown or changing access patterns. And these use cases look something like this. Look behind me. You see retrieval rates change over time. You might have retrieval rates very high at the beginning. You access almost all of your data. Then it goes down. After a few weeks, you access no data at all. After some weeks, it goes up again. And that might change. So let me give you another example. You might have a use case where you store media files. Media files are used oftentimes at the beginning when it's created. Oftentimes, it cools down. And after some time, it's not accessed again. Now, if that media file is attached to a certain event, say a certain tennis match, a certain soccer match, whatever it is, that might become really popular again. So you can see over time that heats up again. And so, in these use cases, it's really hard to figure out what's the right storage class. So we talked before about different storage classes. We talked about S3 standard, optimized for frequently accessed data. 
We talked about standard infrequent access, optimized for infrequently accessed data, and about archive instant, right? The challenge here is you need to know what object should be in what storage class. Should an object be stored in S3 standard and then move after some time into one of those other storage classes? Or maybe should it be archived down into one of the archive storage classes, like S3 Asia Deep Archive? Now, in order to figure that out, it's oftentimes much easier if you have predictable access patterns. But as we know, that's not all the data. Now, for that reason, we launched S3 Intelligent Tiering. And S3 Intelligent Tiering is doing the job for you. What this storage class is doing is, you're just storing your data in that one storage class. It monitors all your storage, and it does that on a very granular object level. So no matter how many objects you have, from thousands to millions to hundreds of millions to billions or even more, it does what it's supposed to do by monitoring on a daily basis which object is accessed and which is not accessed. Now, as soon as objects are not accessed, it moves it down from the frequent access tier into an infrequent access tier, then further down into an archive instant access tier. And it does that by monitoring, right? And so as soon as an object is accessed again, it moves it back up to the frequent access tier. It's doing all that behind the scenes. So the performance you're getting for all those first three access tiers, frequent, infrequent, and archive instant, is the same. There are no retrieval fees. There are no early delete charges. So it's really the storage class, which is the one button, click it, store your data, and don't think about how you access it anymore. Now, intelligent tiering is also very well received for archival data. So what you can do is you can opt in into two archive access tiers. And you can do that on a bucket level, on a prefix level, on an object tag level. So let's say you have data where you know that for a certain bucket, it's OK to have, like, let's say, after one year, asynchronous access. So you can access that in minutes or hours. In that case, you can opt in to the archival access tiers, again, on a prefix, or object tag, or bucket level. And that it moves down automatically into one of those archive tiers. And once again, once you access the data, it just moves it back up into the frequent access tier. It's available for frequent access again, and the whole journey starts again. Now let me ask you, who of you uses all storage classes we have today? Right. So that is oftentimes the case, because it's very hard to figure out what storage class to use. Oftentimes, customers use one or two storage classes. But one recommendation we have is start with intelligent tiering, because it oftentimes does the job for you, and the monitoring fee is very low. Now, intelligent tiering also works very well with serverless applications. It works well with Lambda, SQS, or SNS. And fairly recently, we launched the integration of event notifications. Now, what you can do now with intelligent tiering and event notifications is you can have applications where you receive events when your objects or your data is moved from a synchronous tier, which is accessible immediately, down to an asynchronous tier. So let me give you an example. In the media entertainment industry, oftentimes it's really important to figure out which of your assets are immediately accessible and which one not. So in that case, you can identify event notifications. Intelligent tiering moves it down to an access tier, to an archive access tier, gives you event notifications. You can update your system, and you know what's going on. Let's talk about one specific example. Let's talk about Shutterstock. Many of you know Shutterstock. Shutterstock is a creative platform for brands and media companies. And what Shutterstock is doing, they have a very large media archive. So they store a lot of files. In fact, they store over 400 million, million images and over 24, uh, 25 million video files. And what's special about it is those assets are growing over time. They're actually growing very rapidly. And so optimizing cost is a challenge. Because for one is you have a growing catalog of assets. And for two is those assets are accessed over time differently. So you can imagine, as the example I gave you before, that a media file, an image, is not accessed for some time, but then it's starting getting accessed again. Now, in that case, Shutterstock started using intelligent tiering. They regained up to 50% of their sprint time, so now they can use that for other jobs they have. They stored up to 60, saved up to 60% of their storage cost savings. And more importantly, they don't have to worry about the storage. They could elastically scale at petabytes of data. And that's another thing. So with intelligent tiering, as well as with all of our other storage classes, they elastically scale to whatever demand you have. If you don't have the demand, you can delete the data immediately and start again. Now, let's step back for a moment. 
We talked about one customer. We talked about Shutterstock. They saved up to 60% on cost. Now, when I look at all S3 Intelligent Tiering customers since we launched four years ago, they saved over 750 million in storage cost savings. That's quite a lot of money, and we are very excited about that. Because customers tell us they're using that to keep growing, to innovate on behalf of their customers. And that's exactly what we want to get out of here. Now, we talked before about taking immediate steps. Well, here's an immediate step you can take if you want to start using intelligent tiering today. There's a very easy tutorial. You can run through it. You can immediately start saving costs, putting your data into one of the buckets, start using intelligent tiering, and the rest is done automatically, and you save money without writing a single line of code. OK, so we talked about cost. So optimizing cost is one thing. It's an important thing, and customers love when they get cost savings. Now, at the same time, they tell us optimizing cost is only one. Optimizing performance is the other. We talked about different things, different storage classes, different ways how you can access your data. But when you think about Amazon S3, it scales to tens of millions of requests. And so that allows customers like Netflix to deliver billions of hours of content of Fannie Mae to operationalize hundreds of thousands of loan applications, of FINRA to analyze billions of objects. So it's a very large distributed system. Now, what are the steps you can take to optimize your performance? Well, there are different ways how you can optimize your performance, but oftentimes we see customers who do that very successfully, they do three things. One is they optimize their request rate performance. Two, they optimize their throughput performance. And then three, they monitor the performance, and they operationalize retry logic. So let's talk about those three, three, three things next. So optimizing request rates. It's important to call out that Amazon S3 automatically scales to very high request rates. So out of the gate, you're getting 3,500 put requests per second per prefix, and up to 5,500 get requests per second per prefix. Now, the important thing is per prefix, because you have unlimited prefixes per bucket or per account. There's no limit. You can scale horizontally as much as you want. Now, why is that important? Well, for one is the vast majority of data or of applications, you don't need to take any action. You get automatically the request rate you need. Now, if you have very burst use cases, so let's say, for example, you're launching something, and all of a sudden, from one minute to the next, you're getting a lot of traffic. You get a lot of traffic on one prefix. Well, in that example, you might experience 503 slowdown errors. Let me ask you, who in the room has ever experienced a 503 slowdown error? OK, some. Well, if you use the SDK, you know there's an automatic retry logic. But let's talk about what you can do if you want to optimize your key namespace that you don't get those 503 slowdowns when you have very bursty use cases. So what you want to do here is you want to really like, think about your key namespace. So let me give you this example. Let's say you have a car company. There are multiple cars out in your fleet. They drive around. They collect data. And at the end of the day, they're storing all the data in one bucket. Now, if all those cars come back at the same time, or roughly at the same time, chances are very high they're accessing the same prefix. So look at the key namespace behind me. So you see it's like year month, day, and then the car number, car one, car two, car three, and so on. Well, in that case, you can see they're all accessing the same prefix. And what that means is that the likelihood is very high that the underlying key gets a lot of traffic. Now, what you can do against that? Well, in order to optimize your key namespace, what you really want to do is you want to add entropy. And adding entropy is really something uniformly distributed at the beginning of the key. Right? So you can do that. You see the AC, 1F, DD. And in that case, the likelihood, the probability that the keys are not heating up because they're not in the same prefix is much higher. So in that case, you most certainly don't experience 503 slowdowns. What you can also do here is you can just change Instead of year, month, and day, you can flip it. Start with day, or introduce hour, day, month, and year. And so you can see, by adding entropy at the beginning of the key, you're reducing the probability, and you're increasing your request rate performance. Let's talk next about throughput performance. Who in the room has uh, used multiple prefixes to scale horizontally? 
Great. So that's the way how you optimize throughput performance in S3. You really want to leverage S3 size and S3 scale. And then what that means is you want to have multiple connections on your download and on your upload. So for example, on your upload, you want to have multi-part upload, and on download, you want to have range gets. Now, why is this important? For one, let me start with the good news that the SDK, or most SDKs, at least higher level SDKs, automatically integrate that already. However, you don't have to use the SDK. So let's look into more detail how that is working. Now, if you make larger requests, it's going to take longer, right? For example, a gigabyte size object will take longer than a, multiple, uh, than a megabyte size object. So to improve total latency, what you really want to do is you want to have a number of smaller requests in parallel over multiple connections. So when you're uploading data, you want to use multi-part upload. And when you want to download data, you want to use range gets. So again, you want to use multiple connections over multiple prefixes. And going back to what I mentioned before, you can have unlimited prefixes in S3. And that means you can scale very, very, very horizontally broad and have very, very parallelized use cases. So that's one of the things a lot of customers do to optimize the throughput. Now, finally, let's talk about what you want to do to monitor. There are different ways in S3 you can monitor your performance. You can use CloudWatch metrics, you can use storage lens, and you can use access logs. And all of them give you information of your 503 slowdown errors. With storage lens, you're getting it on a prefix level. With access logs, you're getting all requests. You can filter it down. And then with CloudWatch, you're getting 503 slowdown errors specifically. Now, who in the room is using Storage Lens? It's a fairly new service we launched last year. Great. I recommend all of you switch on Storage Lens. The basic version is for free. There's nothing hurting there. And you get immediately insights into that. And you can start thinking about your storage to how I mentioned it before in cost optimization. Now, to summarize the performance section a little bit, in order to optimize your throughput, scale horizontally over multiple connections. In order to optimize your request rate, you get a very high request rate automatically in S3. And if you have bursty use cases, think about your key namespace. In order to keep your performance high, start monitoring and think about the retry logic. Again, that is already implemented in the SDK. Now, why is all of that important? Well, one of the use cases where cost and, uh, cost and performance is really important are data lakes. And today, we have hundreds of thousands of data lakes in S3. And so one of the customers who has a very optimized data lake on S3 is Torque Robotic. And so Zane will talk a little bit more about what Torque Robotic is doing and what they have done to optimize cost and performance. A manager of the data engineering team at Torque Robotics. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about some of the lessons that we learned when building a data lake primarily on S3. Um, if you don't know about Torque Robotics, Torque Robotics was founded in 2005. It was acquired by Daimler Trucks Auto Group in 2019. And since then has been laser focused on developing an L4 autonomous truck solution. Uh, the key reasons there, one is to uh, support the U.S. economy, delivering critical goods, most of the things around you and that you're wearing, if you bought them in the U.S., were delivered by a truck. Uh, we want to reduce the environmental impact of shipping those goods. So 29% of the U.S. greenhouse gases are emitted by transportation, so automated trucks can optimize for fuel efficiency, and you can run the trucks longer uh, per day than with human drivers, so you get uh, more goods moved uh, per mile with less materials. And uh, probably most importantly, improving safety. There are 415,000 truck crashes per year, and while that's lower than the number of car crashes per year and the fatalities involved are lower, the fatality rates are more than 10 times higher. But we're here to talk about uh, S3 and how we use that. So I mentioned I'm part of the data engineering team, uh, and we don't make the algorithms that go on the vehicle that decide when to change lanes or when to speed up and slow down. We don't determine which sensors go on the truck. We don't define the operating model, uh, and we don't write the simulation. So you know, how, do we, how do we help that laser-focused mission? For us, that's uh, enabling the teams that do all those things uh, by providing them the data, making it available quickly, uh, reliably, scalably, uh, cost-efficiently, and 
from that, from that perspective, uh, I kind of want to describe what does our data look like so you get a, a sense of what is our data lake. Uh, our trucks collect multiple terabytes of data per hour, and we're in a mode where we're collecting all that data, although it's kind of an R&D uh, mode, and the teams really need all the data at the moment. Um, so we have data recorded in binary compressed format. Doesn't lend itself super well to data lakes. 99.8% 99 of the data are images and point clouds, so there's a lot of media files. And then some of the data needs to be kept forever. I think the, the point here is that we have variable retention policies. We also have multiple access patterns. So I mentioned a lot of different use cases and teams. We have like a forensics team that would look into an incident that happened with a truck. Why was there a disengagement or why was there, you know, some incident that happened? Why did the truck behave the way it did? Fleet ops and reporting. So if we want to know how many miles did we go, how many disengagements did we have, on which stretches of road are we doing better over time, et cetera. Algorithm KPIs. So teams that do algorithms like deciding when to change lanes, uh, are they doing better over time as they make changes? Machine learning training data. So we have to be able to help facilitate building those uh, training sets for neural networks to recognize objects. And then finally, lots of ad hoc querying. So people need to know, well, what's in here? What can I, what can I use? So the first step we needed to do was make sure that we got all the data into S3. So we, we chose to work with AWS for the, the community support uh, and the enterprise support. So we migrated all the data that we had on-prem, and we started collecting data directly from the vehicles into S3. And we built a data lake for probably the same reasons that a lot of customers would build a data lake. We, we wanted a centralized catalog for our disparate sources of data. So we have like our on-vehicle data, we have simulation collected data, data from all of our internal tools, weather and traffic data that come from external sources. We need that centralized access governance and uh, we wanted to have the integration with the different processing analysis and dashboarding tools like um, you know, GlueSpark, Athena, Jupyter Notebooks, SageMaker, QuickSight, Tableau, those, those kind of tools. So I mentioned the media problem. We have 99.8% of our total volume, which is many petabytes now, uh, is media. And a data lake is really tabular data. So what did we do? The first thing that we did was we separated the media and the, uh, the tabular data. So we have a process that takes that raw binary compressed data, unpacks it, and splits it up. So we can build a data lake on the tabular part. So one of the things that Christoph was talking about was intelligent tiering. We have a lot of things to do. We have a lot of ground to cover. We don't have a very big team. We do have, as the blue line on the, the chart on the left indicates, a variable retrieval rate. And our red line there is the total storage, and this is one particular bucket, uh, increases steadily over time. The point is, using intelligent tiering is the graph on the right, that as the size continues to increase, our cost is uh, growing in a gap. So like we're, our, our size is outpacing our cost because we're using intelligent tiering. There's a little bump, it's a little confounded because we've changed some of our access patterns, and I'm gonna talk about one of the reasons for why there's a little bump there, it gets close, but then you can see the gap widening again. One thing that we did, and Christoph was just talking about this, was the, the design of prefixes. So we did a pretty good job initially of when we were uploading the data about using a, a UUID to indicate different tests to spread out those prefixes, that's right at the beginning. But then when we started to unpack the media files, we didn't do a great job. So we have the test UID at first, but if you can imagine, you're unpacking data as a truck comes back in, has a lot of data, you start to unpack it. For certain sensors that have a high frequency, uh, suddenly you're spraying a lot of data right at a particular key. And we found that our put object costs accounted for 8% of our total S3 cost. So that's kind of, we don't want to be spending our money there. We have petabytes of data. Uh, seems a little bit useless. So one of the things that we did was something pretty simple. We just bundled the media files into tar files. So take one second of those media files and bundle them together. That comes with a little bit of a cost to package them up in the first place um, and a little bit of a cost on uh, when, you're, when you're retrieving it. But very often people will retrieve bundles of the data. They don't want individual, you know, one camera frame from one particular camera at a time is not always useful. But that did reduce our puts by 99% and eliminated the throttling that we had on the keys. I'm sorry, on the prefixes. 
The other thing about building a data lake, we do use a lot of Amazon Athena. So we had the option of going with something like Redshift, but Redshift has comparatively a pretty high cost, and we do have quite a bit of data. And I think most customers will tell you, you know, you can't go wrong by using Redshift, and that's true, but we wanted to see if we can do that even less expensively. There's a lot of the data. We had no idea how long people are gonna be accessing data after the fact. So we took a look at uh, our Athena query performance, and if you're curious about how that looks for us, going directly to S3. Um, we do pay attention to the S3 prefixes, and we designed how we, uh, how we created those prefixes based on the most common query conditions. And something that kind of goes overlooked is you, you should be setting partition indexes because we've observed that the query times can improve up to 40% by setting partition indexes. So just designing those partitions and setting the indexes will really improve performance. And what we see for, for queries like that is very often less than 20 second query times. That's probably not great for certain user uh, interactive applications, but for many of the analysis applications that we do where time is not so sensitive, that's actually quite good. And you can get longer, so uh, we observe one to 12 minute query times for common full table operations, and, and skipping down to the bottom row, we do have tables with hundreds of billions of rows in them, so even that is actually pretty impressive. And uh, complex queries can go longer, Athena's timeout is, uh, is 30 minutes. We have definitely seen timeouts on some operations that are really complex. But I think the point is, you know, in comparison to, to Redshift, I should go back for a second, in comparison to Redshift, we're not, paying for, we're not paying much for the data that we're not accessing. So when it's stored in S3, we're not paying for it to just sit there and not get used. And then finally, one of the things that we care about for uh, query performance is server-side encryption. So we wanna be able to so store the data securely. It should be encrypted at rest. And we took a look. We wanted to see, does server-side encryption have some performance impact when you're using Athena? And we did a comparison, and there was no impact, which was really impressive. As a matter of fact, in some of the lines, you could see it's like actually a little bit faster. I don't know. I'll have to talk to these guys and find out what magic went into that. But I think the, the main takeaway for us was that S3 does take care of a lot of the performance issues uh, and cost optimization so that we can focus on the capabilities that we can provide to those other teams that get the trucks on the road. And we don't spend our time down under the hood and trying to optimize wherever we really need to. Thank you so much for your time. I'm gonna hand it back to Andrew. Thanks, Zane, for the uh, presentation and for being a great customer. Now, as we wrap up today, Let's put it all together with three immediate steps that you can take. First, uh, switch on S3 Storage Lens for free to begin developing insights about your storage. Second, use S3 Intelligent Tiering to automatically optimize your storage or use one of our specialized storage classes. And three, to optimize performance, think about scaling horizontally on uploads and downloads. Thank you and have a great rest of your week. At reInvent, we'll stick around for some Q&A offstage right here. Thank you.